Hello, my name is Alex McPhail. I'm president of the EXA Consulting Group, and welcome to another presentation from the EXA Consulting Group. Today, we are going to discuss defense procurement in Canada. This presentation demonstrates two important elements of Canadian procurement. First, for huge defense programs, Canada does not select the winning bidder based on the overall price and performance. And the Canadian defense procurement strategy shuts out Canadian-owned businesses. Defense procurement is very complicated and a topic like this takes some time to discuss, so you might want to pause and get a coffee before continuing. It may seem obvious, but it is important to recognize that defense companies rely on defense contracts, and a company can only work on a defense contract if it wins the bid. Defense companies, therefore, live and die by the proposals they win. In order to win a contract, you must submit the best proposal among all your competitors. But what does best mean? Is it lowest price? Highest quality? Fastest delivery? To compare one proposal from another, Canada uses best value basis of selection. These comparisons are not easy. When you are buying a car, for example, is it better to have a car with a more fuel efficient engine? or one with four-wheel drive that has better traction in the winter. Best value takes many disparate factors into consideration and applies an unbiased method to select the bidder that proposes the best overall solution, given technical value and price. That's the theory, anyway. In this presentation, we will explain how best value basis of selection in Canada is really a myth and we will show why it doesn't work. The best value basis of selection falls into three primary areas. Two of them are shown here, technical evaluation and financial evaluation. The technical evaluation considers the bidder's overall technical solution. This is an assessment of all goods and services the bidder proposes to deliver under contract. The financial evaluation is a straightforward calculation of one final price, a single number. It could be based on complex algorithms applied to several spreadsheets, but the output will be a final number. Offsets are the third primary area of the basis of selection. The Canadian government calls offsets Industrial and Technical Benefits and Value Proposition, or ITBVP. For simplicity, we'll, we'll call them offsets. Offsets are the least understood and most important primary area of the basis of selection. They are extremely complicated, and as we shall see later in this presentation, offsets have more sway over the basis of selection than either the technical or the financial scores. The irony is, offsets have nothing to do with the procurement requirements of the proposed solution. In other words, something that has nothing to do with what is being purchased has more influence on which bidder is selected than the quality and price of the proposed solution. The best value basis of selection adds the scores from the technical, financial, and offset evaluations. In this example, bidder number two wins with 79 points. The evaluated scores are weighted meaning they do not all have the same importance in the final score. In this example, the technical evaluation is weighted at 60%, the financial weighting is 25%, and the offsets are weighted at 15%. In a perfect world, a bidder achieving a maximum score in the technical evaluation should win. We will see how this is not true. This slide will take a bit of explaining, so please bear with me. To understand how the basis of selection really works, we need to look at the underlying evaluation criteria. Here we see the same basis of selection, 60% technical, 25% financial, and 15% offsets. Every RFP varies, but this example represents the average basis of selection and evaluation criteria found in most major Crown defense procurements. Here, we see the evaluation overlaid on top of the basis of selection. The first thing you might notice is the large rectangle near the bottom of the technical score. 
This is a 70% mandatory threshold. The mandatory threshold indicates that the bidder must achieve 70% of the total technical points available to submit a compliant bid. If the bidder achieves fewer than 70% of the total technical points, the entire proposal is disqualified. At the top of the technical rectangle is a narrow red band. This is called the 90% achievement level. The achievement level indicates that technical evaluations almost never achieve a score higher than 90% of the total points available. That leaves a range of 20% between the 70% mandatory threshold and the 90% achievement level. 20% of the 60% basis of selection gives us a 12% of technical evaluation shown in the right column. Therefore, the bidder has influence over only 12% of the score that it can exert by leveraging its technical solution. In short, the weight of the technical score is 12%, not 60%. The financial score, you will see two red bands above and below the blue band. This is called the outlier penalty. In most RFPs, if your price is more than 15% higher or less than 15% lower than the mean average price of all bidders, your entire bid is disqualified. Bidders must guess at what the mean average price of all bidders will be and then ensure they submit a price within 15% of that mean average. Because a bidder cannot accurately predict the mean average price of all bidders, a sensible bidder will commit to a bid price within 10% of their best guess of the mean average bid price, further dulling their competitive advantage. This outlier penalty reduces a bidder's financial advantage or leverage to about half of the posted financial weighting or 12% shown in this example. Offsets at the top of the column are measured in Canadian content value shown as CCV and are evaluated as value proposition shown as VP. It is common to see a 1% mandatory threshold on offsets. So 1% of 15% is 0.15%, which does not even register on the column on the right. The resulting offset weight is still basically 15%, as shown in the right column. When you add up all the leverage a bidder can exert to make its offer more competitive than the other bidders, it comes to 39% out of the total 100%. The actual resulting score, of course, will be higher, but the bidder only has influence over 39% of the evaluation. The rest is outside of the bidder's control. When we normalize the actual leverage a bidder has over the evaluated score from 39% back to 100%, now we see the more realistic picture. Suddenly, Offsets, originally worth 15% in the RFP, become the most heavily weighted part of the basis of selection because the bidder has more leverage or influence to achieve the highest final score by manipulating its offsets compared to the leverage it can assert over the technical or financial scores. There is one more factor we should consider. Both the technical and financial evaluations are bounded, meaning there is a maximum limit to the total number of technical points you can earn. And because of the outlier penalty, there is a minimum price you can offer and still submit a compliant bid. But there is no limit to the amount of Canadian content value a bidder can commit to its offsets. It is possible and in fact often required for bidders to commit to spending at least 100% of the entire contract value in Canadian content value for offsets. That means that for every dollar the contractor earns for work it performs, it spends an extra dollar on unrelated offsets. I have seen bidders commit to over 300% of the contract value in offsets. These two factors 
the most significant proportion of the basis of selection and the unbounded nature of the Canadian content value commitment make offsets the most influential element in the basis of selection by far. So here's the bottom line. Offsets, or value proposition, wins the bid. This is true when Canada buys warships, fighter jets, tanks, support services. Put another way, something that has no bearing on what is being delivered has the most influence in which bidder is selected. This is what we mean by the evaluation myth. Now that we understand offsets are responsible for the largest proportion of the basis of selection, we can also see that offsets have nothing to do with the solution the defense contractor delivers to Canada. And we know that bidders often commit Canadian content value worth many times the value of the contract. So the question is, how do companies fund offsets and still make money? To understand that, we need to spend a little time looking at banking and indirect transactions. For the purpose of this discussion, we consider Canadian content value as the value of work performed in Canada by Canadians for Canadians in Canadian dollars. It is actually way more complicated than that, but let's use that definition for now. The defense contractor is contractually obliged to achieve a certain amount of Canadian content value, shown here as obligated CCV. Sometimes the contractor achieves more CCV than is obligated. This is called an overachievement of CCV. In the past, the defense contractor lost all CCV overachievements. Canada changed the rules in 2014 and allowed the contractor to take overachieved Canadian content value and move it into a bank, a bank account, and that became banked CCV. And the contractor could apply that banked CCV to future programs. But the rule changes didn't stop there. Canada allowed a contractor to take unrelated CCV and apply that unrelated CCV also to the bank account. And so now that bank account contained CCV from both overachieved contracts and from unrelated contracts. That unrelated contract was almost certainly not a defense contract. And it didn't necessarily have to be in the same subject matter or area as the original defense contract. It's likely that the contractor had several other contracts and it could take the CCV from those other unrelated contracts and also deposit those to the bank account for CCV. It's worth noting that unlike a defense contract where the contractor can only bank extra CCV, overachieved CCV, the contractor can bank 100% of the CCV achieved in other programs and contracts. So you can see that a contractor can bank much more CCV from its non-defense contracts as it can from its defense contracts because it can only bank the overachieved CCV from its defense contracts. You can see then that a company that specializes in Canadian defense contracting is at a distinct disadvantage because its CCV overachievement bank balance is significantly lower than a company that also banks CCV from its non-defense contracts. So let's see what happens when bank CCV and indirect CCV play a role in defense procurement. Here we have two bidders, Prime Bidder 1 and Prime Bidder 2. Prime Bidder 1 is an international conglomerate with a subsidiary in Canada. It has many divisions that operate in many different sectors such as defense, transportation, marine, aerospace and others. We see Prime Bidder 1 offers 100% of the contract value as obligated in CCV, shown in the lower rectangle. It also offers another 50% of bank CCV, just as we saw from the previous slide. The rules say you cannot offer more than 50% of the contract value in bank CCV. Bidder 1 also has many other unrelated programs and contracts that it can draw CCV from. 
This is called indirect CCV. Indirect means it does not originate directly from the defense contract. In fact, all bank CCV is also indirect CCV because bank CCV always comes from other programs. In this case, instead of depositing its indirect CCV into the bank, it applies that indirect CCV directly to this defense contract. This is a loophole that allows contractors to offer more than 50% indirect CCV to a contract. In fact, there is no limit to the amount of indirect CCV a bidder can apply directly to its bid. In this case, Prime Bidder 1 offers a total of 250% CCV as shown in the three rectangles. 100% obligated CCV, 50% bank CCV, and 100% indirect CCV. Now, let's look at Prime Bidder 2. This is a Canadian-owned company that specializes in defense contracting. It does not have non-defense unrelated contracts, so it cannot generate indirect CCV the way Prime Bidder 1 does. Prime Bidder 2 offers the required 100 CCV plus 10% of banked overachieved CCV for a total of 110% CCV. Remember, offsets are the most important factor in the basis of selection. Even if Prime Bidder 2 offers a superior technical solution at a lower price, chances are it will lose the competition against Prime Bidder 1 because Prime Bidder 1 offers more than twice the offsets than Prime Bidder 2. And so we see Prime Bidder 2 being non-competitive. Now let's bring Prime Bidder 2 back and say maybe you're playing in the wrong field. Maybe you should consider being a subcontractor to someone like Prime Bidder 3. So let's move it over and put it in the subcontractor area to Prime Bidder 3. There are two other subcontractors vying for the same business, Sub 1 and Sub 2. Sub 3 is formerly Prime Bidder 2. Sub 1 and Sub 2 are international conglomerates with subsidiaries in Canada. They have unrelated projects and programs that they can draw CCV from and they can offer 250% CCV with their subcontract offers to Prime Bidder 3. Sub 3 can only offer its 110% CCV. And so even as a subcontractor, we see that Prime Bidder 2, now Sub 3, is non-competitive. Our analysis shows the Canadian defense procurement system favors international conglomerate subsidiaries over Canadian-owned defense contractors. Over time, we expect all Canadian-owned businesses to drop out of that defense market. Let's take a look at the trends over the past decade. Canada introduced the new defense contracting rules in 2014 as part of its defense procurement strategy. That's when bank CCV and value proposition came into effect, which is the current evaluation method for offsets. Here we see defense contracting without offsets. Not all contracts issued for the Department of National Defense have offsets attached to them. Before 2014, Canadian companies occupied 44% of the defense market without offsets. After 2014, that market share grew to 58%. So you could argue that the new rules helped Canadian companies. The picture looks different when we consider contracts with offsets attached. Notice that this market at $24 billion is twice the size of the non-offset market. Before 2014, Canadian companies occupied 26% of the offsets defense market. After 2014, that share collapsed to 7%. These market figures come from Canada's own data. Our analysis shows a few Canadian companies may have shifted from the offset to the non-offset based market, explaining the uptick in the Canadian market share for non-offset programs after 2014. Most companies, especially larger ones, do not have the agility to shift markets so easily. 
Most Canadian-owned companies were shut out of the Canadian offsets defense market after 2014. The future for Canadian-owned companies in the offset defense market is grim. Companies can reduce their operations. They can seek opportunities in the untested and very competitive offshore markets, or they can seek a takeover by a multinational conglomerate. This impact on Canadian-owned defence companies is a direct result of the current Canadian defence procurement strategy. In summary, the Canadian defence procurement strategy makes offsets more important than the technical or financial evaluations. The offsets a company delivers has nothing to do with the delivered solution. The price and quality are less important than the offsets when Canada decides which bidder to select when it purchases ships, airplanes, ground vehicles, and support services. Canadian-owned defence contractors are shut out of Canadian defence procurement, leaving foreign-owned multinational conglomerates dominating the Canadian defence market. This is the reality of the best value myth.